Thank you. I'm actually uh, here for somewhat interesting reason. Uh, Barclays Bank went and uh, invited me down to what they called, I think I'm going to get this right, the Barclays Distributed Banking Hackathon or whatever term they wanted to go use. And I think it was really interesting coming out of that, um, spending the last uh, weekend talking to these people, was really notions of trust. And first of all, I've got to go say that I think that banking community, they get it. You know, they do understand how the software works. They do understand that Bit you know, what Bitcoin provides. But I think I really got the sense they kind of have this sort of blind spot, maybe intentionally, maybe not intentionally, where they want to keep tying everything to notions of identity. And I'm sure regulators really like the idea that every transaction is from one human to another and they know who they are. But what I found very interesting was how talking to these guys, it really became apparent to me how Crypto makes that possible, makes that trust possible without the identity, without the people involved. You know, ultimately, with crypto, you can go have a ledger where what's happened, whether or not what's happened is true, is a matter of math, not a matter of people. Very different than the previous notion of, I have this set of accounting books, I know there are people attached, I am Barclays, you can go trust me to keep the books accurate, We'll occasionally do some audits, and everything will sort of work. And what I actually went and did at the end of that uh, hackathon was I made a little tool, which was really actually aimed at conventional accounting, to go say, well, if you have a set of books, can you go and prove to third parties that you've given them the only copy of the books? Am I giving you the one true record of what I actually did, not a cooked record that says I didn't take your money and I actually gave it to that guy? And well, why does this tool use a Bitcoin blockchain? Because that's what the Bitcoin blockchain does. You know, every single transaction you make is an accounting record saying I had money, I can go prove it. I don't need to go prove it as me as a human being, just me as a set of two numbers, a private key and a public key. And I can go prove that I still had that money because we come to agreements in the blockchain, and now I'm going to give that money to Alice. And the reason why this works still involves trust, of course. It involves trust in miners. You know, we have this group of people burning electricity, turning it into math problems. And if you trust that those people are using the algorithm in the right way, you can then trust that these transactions have actually happened. And that trust is pretty weak. Because currently, everyone in this room could, with relatively little effort, double check that entire process. Miners can double check each other. You know, this is really making auditing cheap. Near zero costs, really. And what we have is a system that incentivizes truth. You know, if you are truthful, within the rules of the system, you will go and get that block reward. And whether or not that can continue, that's sort of another discussion. But the basic principles is the one thing we can all agree on is we'd like to have an accurate, truthful record of what happened. Now, going forward, people are trying to do what everyone loves to call Bitcoin 2.0. You know, how can you go take this technology and move it past that? How can you go do more interesting things? I mean, maybe I want to go and issue gold and move my gold around. Maybe I want to have a distributed stock market trading gold for Bitcoins. Maybe I want to do something totally different. Maybe I just want to use these underlying mechanisms to ensure that when you download a copy of my software, you know I haven't been compromised by the NSA or whatever it is, and I'm giving you a special copy that breaks your privacy. If you're a journalist, you really want to know that Tor is being honest, for instance. Yet I'll also go point out, I think within the Bitcoin community, we also have another model that's kind of coming about, where we rely on this third-party trust of miners even more. For instance, 
many of you probably have an Android phone, and you might be running Bitcoin J through, say, Android Wallet. Well, how does that work? It simply says, I'm pretty sure these miners are trustworthy, so I'm going to trust whatever they say. I could create a transaction as a miner that gave you 21 million Bitcoins, and your Android Wallet would pop up saying, yep, 21 million Bitcoins, because it doesn't know. Maybe it is the case that everyone in the Bitcoin community just gave you that money. And this, this code, the literal piece of software, trusts that. Personally, I don't really agree with that model. I think that is actually getting back to the trusted third parties that we've rejected before. Similarly, you go have things like sidechains, where the idea is you go push this trust even further, where we're going to assume that we can extend this model of incentivizing some type of honest behavior by creating some sort of crypto system that somehow creates those incentives. But us as users are just going to trust that they're doing that. You know, we have a, this proposed sidechains model where, say, Blockstream is, well, if I want to do something with Bitcoin that Bitcoin can't currently do and I want to use a currency, I put in a special address where to spend money from the address is to go prove that you have a lot of computers sitting in your basement burning electricity. And somehow that makes me trustworthy. Yes, you can maybe audit what they're doing, but ultimately that is still a trusted third party. Me personally, I'd rather keep the other way. I'd rather keep pushing auditing further out, further out into the community of individuals who want to know whether or not what their software is telling them is money, is money. And I'll go keep this talk a bit shorter than the other ones, but you know, that's kind of what I think I'd like the community to start thinking about. So let's go on to questions. You know, I was asked by the organizers to go repeat questions so they'd get recorded on the microphone. I'm not quite sure how I'm going to summarize that one, but I'll, uh, I think I could summarize it by saying you were really questioning whether or not Bitcoin can be repeated in the sense that it relies so heavily on these, let's see if I get this right, so heavily on these sort of social incentives. Yeah. So this question of having knowledge of the system, therefore being able to game the system, I think actually goes back to cryptographic principle of you should design cryptographic systems where your attacker knows just as much about the system as you do. So if, I mean, sort of at the high level, if it is true that Bitcoin is something where your attackers can game the system after they understand how it works, then I think we're going to find that Bitcoin will fail. However, I would then also go point out that, going back to this notion of truth in records, you know, within the definition of a cryptographic system, what happens happens because of what statements people made. You know, maybe an analogy to go make is within banks. Um, it was very interesting talking to these banking guys, but exactly how does this really work? You know, what's really going on when I send money from bank A to bank B? And they kept on bringing up settlements, where you'll have some third party, maybe it's government, maybe it's some organization, whatever it is, they will go and somehow settle these transactions. And it was always kind of interesting trying to get these guys to nail down, when exactly does the money move? And it's actually it's really obvious in a cryptographic system. 
It's when we come to consensus that someone made a statement, I wish to go send my money to Bob. That is when the money moves. When, from the point of view of everyone who may want to participate in that, comes to consensus that I actually said that. And I didn't say, I'm going to send my, my money to Alice first. So in context of gaming the system, well, if your system is based just on truthful statements that are audited by the people who want to rely on them, what is there to gain? So long as the system of recording truthful statements works, the meaning of those truthful statements is entirely up to consenting individuals. I may consent to run software, and I may assign meaning to the fact that it says now I have bitcoins. And as long as I verify that for myself, within the definition of that, you can't game me. You can try to convince me to running bad software, but bad versus good is something we can come to consensus to. You know, something that we can evaluate for ourselves. The question was, uh, what am I most excited about in the space? And it's actually really simple things. It's, uh, I'm very excited about, I also want to go call it blockchain 1.5 projects <laughs> that do simple things and they do them well. And in many of these projects, I mean, I think I would label Ethereum as an example and Blockstream as an example. It's not entirely clear to me what people will actually want to use this for. Whereas me personally, for instance, I'm working on colored coins where I have a client who's paying me real money because he has real clients who want to go and have this essentially accounting software to exist. What it does is very simple. It lets you use the Bitcoin blockchain to know how things moved according to some rules and why are the rules meaningful? Because some physical human being said, well, I've got, vault, I've got gold sitting in this vault and if by those rules it now says you own the gold, I'll ship you that gold. Very, very simple, very easy to understand. Any more? Yeah, so um, the question was about my, uh, my program, Unique Bits, um, the proof of concept to prove that one set of counting records exists and how it actually works. So I guess I can go explain, there's sort of two things blockchains do, and they're kind of interrelated. And the first one is this notion of a timestamp, which is say that some piece of data existed before some time. You know, I can kind of make the analogy of classified section of the New York Times. I think we can all agree the New York Times is some sort of trustable entity. We can all agree what they have published. That's a matter of sort of public record. I'm sure you may have agents sneakily running into libraries around the world swapping out copies of the New York Times, but that's not very easy to do. So to some extent we can agree on what's actually in the New York Times. And to timestamp a piece of data, well, I would go take that data, I'd apply an operation called a hash, which then creates a much smaller piece of data, such that it's really, really, really hard to find another piece of data that has the same hash as the first one. So essentially, we've got a reference to it. Well, I go take that reference and I put it in the New York Times. Or I might take 20 pieces of data, hash them all together, put it in the New York Times. I open up the page, I see the data on the New York Times, I know that data must have existed before that date. The second part that Bitcoin does is an extension of that, which I call proof of publication. It's that if I took the data itself and published it in the New York Times, in the classified section, like say a legal notice, I can go prove that anyone who had access to that document, which is the readership of the New York Times, could have seen that data. And we can create an accounting system out of this. We can go say, Peter Dollars. If you want to go move a Peter Dollar around, well, they start in some genesis point, which is I gave them to you. We record that fact in the New York Times classifieds. And when you want to give it to someone else, you record that fact as well. And the definition of a valid Peter Dollar 
is that I can go prove to you with old copies of the New York Times again, step by step by step it moved backwards. Well, doing this with actual human beings is very, very annoying, but cryptography can automate all this. And from that primitive, you can do a lot of things. What does this unique bit software do? Well, it's roughly the equivalent of taking your counting records, hashing them, making a little number with it, putting it in the New York Times with a cryptographic signature so you know who it came from. And you do that on the Bitcoin blockchain. If I try to lie to you by creating two sets of books, well, when I give you that other set of books, you're going to look in the blockchain and say, hang on a second, you claimed that hash 12345 corresponded to your books. Why don't you give me a copy of those so I can see what's different? You know, what's going on here? Why are you not giving me the full set of data you claimed is true? Hope that made sense. Yeah, I think we were. So the question was, could a system like colored coins be used for debt? And I remember this question coming up at the Barclays conference as well, where I kind of made the analogy of, in systems where you do not have debt, it's very clear that you do not necessarily need to know anything about identity. Because if there's no debt, whether or not you gave me something is a matter of record. It's not a matter of who you are or who I am. It's a matter of what's in this public record. Now with debt, if we turn the debt into an asset, when we make it into something like a bond, whether or not you've given me that bond is still a matter of public record. Who I am is actually still irrelevant. Who you are, however, is. If you were the one issuing the debt, because I want to know, are you likely to go repay me? If you're some anonymous Tor website, chances are you won't. But that's a very one-sided thing. And equally, that's also a separate layer from the underlying accounting layer. I'm the only person in the world who needs to know who you are. And if I give it to someone else who wants to also purchase that debt, which is a legal right, well, then they become the only person in the world who needs to know who they are. The accounting records, that's a separate layer. I'm going to go summarize that to go say uh, a bunch of people who actually are involved with finance were having an argument about what it all means. Me, I'm a technical guy. I'm just going to keep the records right. <laughs> I don't really care what they mean. I just care that they're right. And what your definition of right is, well, that's up to you to decide. Thank you.